Hey, I'm Ricky. I'm a co-founder here at Income School. And today I want to share with you my complete guide to SEO for 2022. This is our clean SEO strategy. That's the approach we take here at Income School. And you're going to understand why throughout this video. SEO is an ever evolving world. Search algorithms are constantly changing and it's on us to make sure that we understand how they work and we understand how to craft content that can really drive organic traffic, actual people, lots of people to our websites. For parts of this video, I'm going to be showing my computer screen. Some of it, I'll be sitting at a desk showing you some stuff. For other parts of it, I'm going to be here at the Blackboard. I really do like using it. I just think it's remarkable. This represents years and years of testing, of trying, of sometimes failing, of refining, of teaching and refining and teaching and refining and testing. And it's a lot, a lot of work that's gone into the knowledge that I'll be sharing with you here today. But what's cool is through all that time, we've been able to build up multiple websites where in under a year, we achieved over 100,000 page views per month from organic traffic from search. Our websites have been viewed multiple tens of millions of times, again, just from searchers on the web. Our students in our Project 24 program are achieving success every single day. We have new people achieving the $1,000 a month and full-time income milestones that we have every week. And one of the things that we've come to love is that using these strategies, when Google puts out their algorithm updates, which are pretty regular now, we never have to worry. In fact, algorithm updates have a tendency to improve our rankings over time. Now, most site owners and SEOs can't say that. Algorithm updates have a tendency to be very, very stressful times. And frankly, there are a lot of ways you could do this totally wrong. And those ways can cost you a lot of money and can end up costing you even more in wasted time. I run into people all the time who have a website who, when they find out what I do, will say, you know, maybe, maybe you can help me here. I've been trying for a long time. And in, it really, it's invariably across the board, whether they have a blog or a niche site, or they have a local business, or they have just a non-local business, they're an e-commerce, whatever type of website it is, they're trying to get organic traffic and everything they've tried so far following the conventional wisdom has completely failed them. I talk to them about this approach and at some point, if they've actually implemented it, they'll come back to me and they'll say, I did it. I wrote an article and it succeeded. I'm finally ranking on Google. It's driving traffic to my website and it's bringing people to my business. Then once they implement that on a larger scale, it's amazing the impact that it has. So now we're going to go to my office and we're going to dive into the first topic. SEO in simple terms is about optimizing our own content on our own websites, as well as our presence on the web itself to help ensure that we do the best possible in search engine rankings so that we can get people coming to our site just from their searches. And that's a really big deal. Businesses pay a lot of money to get people to see their products and to see their content. And when we can just get people to see it because they're looking for it, that's even better. A fair amount of what I'm going to tell you today is based on Google's quality rater guidelines. But let me tell you what that is. It's a document that Google puts out for their quality raters. You see, Google hires a ton of people from all around the world to take specific URLs that Google assigns them and to essentially fill out a survey about the quality of that content, taking into account a ton of different factors. So what Google's doing is it's taking humans and giving them specific criteria for how to rate the quality of certain content on the web. And then they're seeing, I believe, how that pairs up with how their computer is measuring that same content. And they're using that to update the algorithm and improve it to help it better be in line with what a human would view as quality authoritative content. So how exactly Google uses that information, whether it's to manually impact how that content ranks, which I don't believe to be the case, or to help to improve the algorithm, it's immaterial. What those quality rater guidelines actually tell us is these are the things that Google has defined as quality and authoritative content. And those are the things they're trying to measure with their algorithm. So as they update and improve the algorithm, we're already meeting their end goal, their objective. So that keeps us ahead of the Google algorithm updates. It's like if Google decides to change the tool they're using to measure, you know, from a ruler to a measuring tape, it doesn't really matter because our end result is the same. We have passed the test because we've passed the intent of the test. So the quality rater guidelines were not intended for professional SEOs. 
um, as their guideline for everything SEO related. And we understand that. But Google has also said that it's a document that SEOs would really benefit from reading. But it's not a complete SEO guide, so we'll work on filling in those blanks here. Back to the board. Okay, let's jump into ranking factors. There are literally hundreds of ranking factors. For years, people have said over 200, and that's kind of where we've landed. And honestly, I think that number continues to grow as the algorithm gets more and more sophisticated. But we're gonna talk about the most important ones. One thing to keep in mind is there are numerous things that Google is measuring that are impacting some of these top ranking factors that we're gonna talk about today. So, you know, this one item may be a top ranking factor, but Google may be measuring it using a whole bunch of different metrics. So keep that in mind when you hear that 200 plus number. The most important ranking factor, bar none, I mean, there's really no argument about this, is relevance. It actually gets its own bullet point here because we're gonna talk about how to improve our relevance on the web. And that actually makes a ton of sense. I mean, think about it here. Let's say you have a really good article all about dirt bike maintenance, right? And you have done all the work, you've made an awesome piece of content, you've got thousands of backlinks, you're the most authoritative person in the entire industry on dirt bikes, and somebody does a search for how to braid a girl's hair. Your article will not and absolutely should not rank for that, right? We actually have to craft content that pairs with search queries in order for our content to be able to rank. This seems again obvious, and yet this is the number one mistake most bloggers have a tendency to make. We'll come back to that one a little bit more a little bit later. The next most important ranking factor is EAT, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. Now, most SEOs will tell you, no, 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 the number one ranking factor is backlinks, right? And of course, you know, ignoring relevance. The number one ranking factor is backlinks. You're gonna find that all over the internet. That's what people are saying. But backlinks is actually just one of the ways that Google is trying to measure your expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. The reason is, is that when someone else from their website links to your site or to a specific piece of content on your site, that is kind of like a vote in favor of the accuracy and the value of that content. And so if you have a lot of backlinks from reputable and relevant websites within your industry, Google can actually easily see and measure those and see that this is probably a fairly authoritative piece of content or an authoritative site or author. And so therefore, we can rank it better with a little bit more confidence. We'll go into a bit more detail about EAT later on in this video. The next ranking factor is the user experience. Now, Google has a ton, a ton, a ton of data. Google knows on the search results exactly which articles are getting clicked the most. And in many cases, they know which articles are getting people to stay on them and potentially click through to other articles. They're able to see when somebody clicks on one of the search results and then quickly comes back and just clicks on another one. All of those behaviors are indications to Google of which content is more valuable. If your content gets clicked on more frequently than the articles ranking above it, and if based upon their activity, uh, users are indicating that they're having a better experience with your content, Google is going to lift it in the rankings. Google's performing all sorts of user testing on all of the content on the web and adjusting where each piece of content ranks over time, which is one of the big reasons why having quality content is extremely important. Now, there are a bunch of other ranking factors that are also important. Um, whether or not you're using images on your website. Um, do you have outbound links, links where you link to other pieces of content? And what kind of content are you linking out to? If you're linking out to garbage content, that can have a negative impact on your site. The age of the content on your website. This is actually an important one to understand, so we're gonna come back and talk about that one in just a minute. They're looking at numerous uh, social signals and really kind of across the board, uh, you know, in some industries, Pinterest boards and YouTube channels and um, other social media groups and communities that you participate in and mentions and all sorts of those things. The structure itself of your website, the content that you have in various topics of your website and how those are linked together across your site. And I have to mention here core web vitals. Core web vitals are some metrics that Google uses to measure people's experience on your site as it relates to how well and how quickly the content on your site loads. I have a whole video going into detail about the different metrics in Core Web Vitals and what to do about them, which I'll link to down in the description. So now let's go sit down and we'll talk a little bit about content age and the role that plays in your SEO. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about content age. Google actually has a patent, you can actually go find it, um, that talks a little bit about this technology they use that they call stepped ranking. The gist of it is this. When a piece of content first gets published and then Google indexes it, puts it into their index, it receives an initial ranking based upon all the information Google has. When your site is brand new, Google knows nothing about the site and it knows nothing about the content except what's in the content. And so based upon that, it's gonna receive a pretty low ranking. But then Google proceeds to do user testing. They see how users behave on the website. They see if they test it, if they put it, well, let's try it on page two or even page one of Google. And as users see it, do they click on it? If users click on it, do they pogo stick? Do they bounce right back out of the article and click on another one? Or do they click on it and then they're done with this search? The latter generally indicates that that piece of content was good enough for that user. And as they see this over time happening, they're able to get a better and better and better picture of where that content should rank. But this doesn't happen very quickly for brand new sites. Typically we find that a brand new website with all new content is gonna take solidly six to eight months before that content really starts to get picked up organically without doing anything else to it. Now we do have some really, really interesting ways and really awesome ways to speed that up that we're gonna talk about in this video. But even so, it's important to have that expectation that there is gonna be a period of time on your website. We call it the ghost town phase because it's like you're writing an article and publishing it to a ghost town. But then as Google gains more and more information about you and about your site and how well it generally performs with users in um, certain genres and you start to get more authority within the, the industry, we find that this changes entirely. That first step ranking that you get, Google has way more information. And so we find that oftentimes an article gets indexed and immediately we're right there on page one of Google, oftentimes even very near the top. Now we have to be careful when trying to shortcut this ghost town phase. A lot of people try to shortcut it using tactics that Google has gotten better and better and better at penalizing because they're intended to manipulate the algorithm. You see the algorithm's goal is to determine which content is most relevant for the user, but also most accurate, most helpful, most authoritative, most trustworthy. We need to establish that, and if we establish it in an organic way, then we never run into trouble when Google updates their algorithm. A lot of people try to shortcut this ghost town phase by using tactics intended to manipulate the Google algorithm. These tactics can be really dangerous. The, the number one is by building links. Backlinks, getting them early on, can quickly give Google an indication that your content is trustworthy, that it's authoritative. But if it turns out that those backlinks are not at all organic and that they were obtained through um, payment, you paid for them, uh, link trading schemes, any of the things that Google lists as link schemes, um, I have a video all about that. I'm gonna link to that here in the description. Um, any of those tactics can end up leading to either an algorithmic penalty to your site, meaning the algorithm improves and identifies those link schemes, and so, boom, you just lose traffic. Your rankings drop. Or it can happen through a manual penalty by Google that can be very detrimental to your entire website. So again, I'll show you what we do to establish that EAT and to actually get those links in a natural, organic way that's actually extremely effective and frankly, takes a lot less time and effort. Um, but also, we'll talk about another cool technique that we have to speed up that process. Okay, we gotta dive more into relevance. This is key. And the most important thing that's made our sites, as well as those of our students, our members, and people who have been following us here on this YouTube channel, more successful. So let me illustrate this. Most local businesses, they all want to rank for the same thing, which is profession, whatever my profession is. Let's, let's use photographers as an example. So family photographers in Boise, Idaho. But every photographer in the Boise area wants to rank for that. And so how do we do it? Well, they all kind of do the same things, right? I need a Google listing. I should probably have a website to go with it um, that has information about my business, my hours, my location, and all that kind of stuff so that Google can see I'm a legitimate business. And then let's get uh, as many reviews as we can. Yeah, that'll do it, that'll do it. You should do that if you're a local business. But that's certainly not all you should do. Let's talk about how we could use content to actually rank for things that people are searching for, not just photographers in Boise, Idaho. You see, whoever wins that, great. It's the first one that comes up on the map listing. And it's probably the first one I'm gonna click on as I'm doing research uh, for which photographers I'm gonna hire, if that's the first search that I did. But if I'm doing research on photography in the area, 
there are some other searches I might be performing as well. So what if we wrote an article answering the question, how much do family photography portrait sessions cost in Boise, Idaho? Now, to craft the best piece of content for that, it would be great to go look around and find out what other photographers are charging. Um, you want to break this down into detail, right? So um, freelance photographers, uh, photography studios, um, you know, what are kind of the different tiers or the different levels of photographers in the area that do family portrait photography? Let's find out and try to get a reasonable average of what each one charges for a session. You might even pull in other information like uh, the types of sessions that they run. Do they do it on location? A uh, location of your choice? Does it have to be within a certain area? Do they do it in a studio and only in a studio? Uh, what are the things that impact the pricing? Let's get a thorough guide so that somebody can make a decision and know, okay, that photographer, they're way, they're way out. They're charging so much more than the average because this article pulled that information together for me. Do that, you rank for that search query, and even though not everybody is searching that, the ones who are, are gonna find your website, and that article can point them over to your service, where you say, for those who want an outdoor photo session at a location of their choice, here's my rate that I charge, and here's everything that's included in that. Boom, you've got a lead. Something that you didn't get if you were just trying to rank for family photographers in Boise, Idaho, and you haven't been listed on Google for like 20 years because some of them have. For businesses, I would say especially local businesses, those how much does it cost search queries are often pretty underserved and they're really good. A lot of people actually search for those types of search queries, but there are lots of other queries that you could also try to write content for. How about do family portrait photographers in Boise typically give you digital photos or just the prints? Or how long does a senior photo session typically last? or what are the best locations in the Boise area for senior photos. As you start to dig into that, you'll find that there are probably dozens and dozens and dozens of search queries that people in your area are probably searching that no one's actually written really definitive content for. Write that content, you'll start to get that traffic, and what's gonna happen is, as Google sees you ranking really well for all these search terms around photography in Boise, Idaho, guess what happens to your overall authoritativeness on the subject? It goes up. And guess what? Even with fewer Google reviews, you start to go right up higher in the rankings for family photographers in Boise, Idaho. I recently talked with a small business owner who was telling me, I don't get it. In my industry, there's this one site. You can't do a search in my industry and not see them. But their site looks so outdated. And I started teaching him about this. And what did he, what did he do? He went and looked at the site and said, Oh my gosh, that site has over 100 blog posts on it. Nobody else does. That's why it's ranking so well for everything. Even if they didn't write an article on the specific topic, because they have so much content and they're the most authoritative source, they get the traffic. Most new bloggers make their own version of the exact same mistake. What they do is they start their brand new blog and they start writing content, basically just trying to get whatever thing off their chest that they want to get off their chest. The topic is something of interest to them and they say, okay, this is the thing I want everybody to know about this subject. And they go write that first. But what they forget is you need a search query. You have to craft your content to respond to something someone's actually searching for. So here's an example. Let's say you just started a new blog about quilting. I happen to know a thing or two about quilting, believe it or not. And let's say you hate minky fabric for quilt backings. I don't know why you would hate that. It's soft, it's comfortable, and it looks cool. But let's say you hate it anyway. And so you write the article, why I can't stand minky for quilt backings. And in the article, you proceed to rant about all the reasons why you hate it. What's the search query that that's meant to address? Say it's my blog, why Ricky Kessler uh, hates minky. Now, <laughs> like nobody's gonna search that, right? Not a single person on the planet wants to know why I might hate using Minky. Again, I don't, and that sounds kind of silly coming out of my mouth. But we do this because this is the kind of content we see spreading on social media. This is the kind of content that's got maybe some interest behind it. These articles with these kind of strong and opinionated headlines and stuff, and if they spread fine on social media, if it happens to go viral, fantastic. That's the kind of content that does that. But the odds of that ever happening with your blog post are so minuscule that it's really not worth it. It's far better to take this approach. Start with the topic, why Minky is a bad backing for quilts, parentheses, three great alternatives. 
Now you actually go through and write a structured article about the specific reasons why Minky isn't a very good backing for quilting. And then you provide three great alternatives. And then for someone who is searching, can you use Minky for quilt backing? Your article has the potential to rank and actually answer that question. Whereas your other article that was framed more as a rant is probably not. So our approach is to start with the search query and to craft content specifically meant to answer that search query. So let me show you some examples of how we go through that process that we call search analysis. We actually have several techniques and an entire process called search analysis. There are hours of training in Project 24 about exactly how to do this. By the way, if you don't know, Project 24 is our membership. It's a, it's a program that's just like lays out step by step by step exactly how to do all of this stuff and a whole bunch more. But um, it's, it's really cool. But there's hours of material in there, much more than we can cover in this video. But I want to give you at least some tools that you can use that are going to be helpful. The main tool that we use is Google itself. Okay. So let's say that I have a business or a website and we'll go back to the quilting industry. Okay. And let's say that I'm kind of stuck on Minky, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Google search and I'm going to make sure that I'm using a browser that I'm not logged in on. And I basically never log in. I right here, this is Safari. I basically don't use Safari for my day to day searches. Um, I don't log into Google on it. And so what I'm able to do because of that is get kind of a, a clean um, result here. Google doesn't know a whole lot about me because I don't use this browser <laughs> and I'm not logged in. And so Google's going to give me kind of clean results. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start typing a, a partial search here. Again, we're back to quilting. So does Minky fabric fray? Does Minky fabric shrink? Now notice I didn't start with quilting as like my main search word. My main keyword in here was Minky. Minky is a type of fabric that people use on blankets and quilts. Why did I do that? Well, people often start with the highest level search query, the highest level keyword like quilting. And what do we end up coming up with first? The most common, the most obvious, and therefore the most competitive search queries. But here I could have an entire category of content on a quilting website that's just about different fabrics. Does Minky fabric fray? Does Minky fabric shrink? Does Minky fray? Does Minky stretch? Uh, this is not the same. Does Minky fabric bleed? Back to shrink. So we're kind of getting repetitions here. And so um, does Minky fabric, I'm going to uh, type that in. Oh, is Minky fabric hot? Is it absorbent? But now what I'm going to do that's even better, the auto suggest is, is helpful, but I like this one even better. I'm going to hit enter with a partial search. And I'm going to see what the people also ask says. What is Minky Fabric good for? I could see myself now writing an article. Well, maybe not myself, but some people that I know <laughs> writing an article about, you know, my, you know, the five best uses for Minky Fabric. Well, that's an article that could rank for this search query. What is Minky Fabric good for? Does Minky Fabric shrink when washed? I mean, people, I mean, the auto suggest gave us, does it shrink? But when washed is kind of the obvious follow up to that. That's when fabrics have a tendency to shrink. That's a good question. And so now we have a pretty good indication since Google gave us this right here. It gave a pretty good indication that there are people actually searching for this. What is so special about minky blankets? Could you write an article about the, the top 10 reasons people love using minky in blankets? I think you could. Is dur how durable is Minky? This one I'm already envisioning like kind of a fun test um, of like 10 different fabrics and putting them through different durability tests. That could be kind of fun. And now what we have is a, is a large blog post with experimental information and data. Um, I could see you filming some video to go along with this. It could be a ton of fun to put that together. And then you have a fairly definitive guide on fabric durability. And that is going to rank for this because Minky is going to be one of those fabrics. Now check this out. I open this up, I close it, and boom, I get a couple more. Is cuddle fabric the same as minky fabric? I could see writing an article of what's the difference between minky and, and cuddle fabric. Uh, why does minky fabric have dots? And so on and so on and so on. As I scroll down, I can find here at the bottom related searches. Now, these often kind of go a little bit further um, astray, but some of these will often give me an idea of other things that I could write about. The next thing I can do is actually follow one of these searches. Okay, so how durable is Minky? I could actually go 
search for how durable is Minky and then scroll down and boom, people also ask. Then I can go further and further and further and further down this rabbit hole and find all sorts of search queries people are asking just about Minky fabric. You can see that there are probably thousands of potential search queries that I could write about, about fabrics. The next step is to actually use my brain, if I know anything about my industry, and determine whether or not I think the search volume is adequate. Now, we don't use keyword research tools for this. Let me tell you why. This here is essentially half of a normal bell curve. It's a statistics thing, right? And what this represents is along this axis are all the things people are searching for in Google. And then the height represents how many people are searching for those things. There are some things that get searched by millions of people every day. And they're here on the left side. And then there's this huge long line that extends out very far that direction of things that a few people search every day. And by a few, in Google terms, where there are literally billions of searches a day, in Google terms, a few might be hundreds per day, even thousands per day. But this is called the long tail. So if you ever hear anybody talk about long tail keywords, it's because they're talking about everything that's past this dotted line, right? Everything that falls into the tail and isn't part of the main, the main body of the curve. The keyword research tools are relying upon a sampling of the searches that are being performed. And in statistics, a sampling does a really good job of reflecting the general curve shape. These things that are searched a lot are going to be represented heavily in the sampling. But the search queries out here, most of them won't show up in the sample at all. And if they don't show up in the sample, then the tool has to guess. Is this likely to have 10 searches, 50 searches, 100? Or in many cases, they just say zero. And that's why we regularly write articles on search queries where the tools would tell you the search volume is zero, and yet we still end up getting hundreds or even thousands of people who land on those articles from Google search every single month. And that's all I have to say about that. Now, don't get me wrong. There are keyword research tools I love. My favorite one is Ahrefs. It's got a ton of cool tools in it. However, if you're just getting started blogging and you're not making a bunch of money from it yet, I don't think it's a tool that you need to have. And you can get a ton of value just by doing this and estimating with your mind. Now, we do have some other methods we like to use to estimate potential search volume, but those methods are most effective, again, when the search volume is high. Everything that's kind of in the normal range of the average article we're gonna write, you mostly just have to use common sense to determine, is this a reasonable question for people to ask? And then we have our model called the inverted pyramid. The inverted pyramid is essentially this. At the base of the pyramid, the widest point, there are search queries that all sorts of people are gonna ask. These are things that people might ask even if they're only interested in potentially getting into this hobby. Or um, if it's in a totally different industry, maybe it's a, a jobs related site. Um, there are search queries where people who are considering that profession, they're gonna ask that search query. So there's a high volume. But the further down you go, you get to the point where like in the quilting industry, these are the people that are like, okay, yeah, I, I, I like to sew the quilts and stuff and, uh, and make them and um, I'm into it. It's definitely a hobby I'm doing. And there are the search queries that all of those people will, will want to write about. And then at the tip of the pyramid, we have apex queries. And these are queries that are only going to be searched by people who are very far down that road. There are search queries like in quilting where only the people that actually own their own long arm quilter are going to be typing in those search queries. Now, for those of you who don't know about quilting, a long arm quilter is like a $20,000 investment. And so most people that are into quilting don't have their own. And so, that's probably not the type of search query we're gonna write a lot of content about because a lot fewer people are searching those. Use your brain. How big is the pyramid? Are there a lot of people into quilting? Yes, yes, there are a lot of people into quilting. And so if there's a search query that's anywhere near the base or even kind of the middle of that pyramid, I'm good, I'm gonna write it. The search volume may only be 100, but it may be 10,000. And if it's anywhere in the middle of there, I'm actually pretty happy with it. Okay, now for mastering on-page SEO. On-page SEO is essentially everything you do on your own site to optimize it for search engines. Let's talk about the content first. People ask me a lot, how long should a blog post be to do well for SEO? We need to stop thinking that way. For a long time, people thought longer content ranked better simply because there was a correlation between the two. What we found though, as we actually did a bunch of testing, 
was that it had more to do with the depth that you go into with the content, how well you cover the topic than it did with how long the post was. It's just that when a blog post is really short, it's hard to cover something in very much depth. So there are two types of posts that we write. The first one is called a response post. The goal with the response post is to take one primary search query and we're gonna cover that topic in depth, essentially providing the best resource on the web for that one specific question. That doesn't preclude that article from ranking for numerous other tangentially related topics, but it's targeted toward one. These posts are about a thousand words long. Again, it's not because it's the length that matters, but we found that if we target a number like 750 words, we don't end up covering the topic deep enough to do as well in search. The other type of post that we write is a staple post. Typically, we shoot for 2,000 plus words. And this is because with these posts, while sometimes we may be targeting one primary search query, oftentimes we're covering a bigger topic. We're covering it in depth, requires more information. But other times we're actually covering multiple search queries within one article, even though it's all on one main topic. The main point here is we need to size the content to the topic, not just assume that there's some sort of ideal length that's perfect for every single blog post. When you're starting a new site, or if you have an established site but it hasn't done well yet, you haven't been able to build up authority, what I recommend is to start by writing mostly just response posts and pick specific queries. Don't start with things that are really broad. Something like best kitchen mixer, you're gonna have a ton of other articles that are comparing the top kitchen mixers. It's gonna be really competitive. It's not a specific enough search query. Instead, we write an article on how long does a Bosch six and a half quart universal mixer typically last? Then what do we do? We go to forums and we go to Facebook groups that are for bakers and stuff and we ask that question. Or we search and see if others have already asked it. And let's get some polling data. Let's get a response from numerous other people who've had theirs for years and see how long theirs have lasted. That article's answering a specific question and will have a lot more potential to rank well on a younger site than something so broad and so competitive as Best Mixer. Now let's go into some specific ways to optimize content for SEO. One fantastic way to speed up that process of getting your content ranked, but using on-page SEO techniques is through snippet optimization. The rich snippet is this, let me show you an example. There are lots of different formats these, these can take. So here's an article, um, how many or how much mashed potatoes per person, that's the top resort or this top search query, but the next one for 30 people. I'm serving a big group of 30 people, how much mashed potatoes do I need? You can see this section right here at the very top. The text right here, when catering to large groups, plan on each person eating about half a pound of mashed potatoes as a side dish. I'm gonna to go to that article and let me show it to you. See this right here at the very beginning? When catering to large groups, plan on each person eating about a half a pound of mashed potatoes as a side dish. To serve 30 people, boom, answer to the question. About 15 pounds of mashed potatoes will be needed. This is what we call an answer target. It is the segment of the article that specifically and deliberately answers the search query that we wrote this article to rank for. Now, we also answer multiple other questions like how much mashed potatoes do you need per person as well as for 25 people, 20 people. If I go back down the article, you'll see there's this table here. If somebody searched one of these other numbers, this table could potentially show up as the featured snippet. It's also gonna help this article rank for all of those different numbers of people. But not only do we have how much do I need in the end, we have a table that covers how many potatoes do I need to make that much mashed potatoes? We have another table for how much instant mashed potatoes do I need to serve this many people? We have another table way down at the bottom that's how much gravy do I need to go with that much mashed potatoes on average? You can see how this one article could potentially rank for numerous search queries, but we've only written one article. For example, if I'm serving mashed potatoes to a large group, What's some other helpful information that I would need to know? When we serve to large groups of people, oftentimes it's either we're catering it or it's like a, a, a big holiday dinner or a potluck type scenario where I'm preparing it elsewhere and now I need to keep it warm and serve it. We're gonna cover that in this segment of the article. On-page SEO is all about writing content that answers the questions that people are actually searching and then helping Google, making it easy for Google and other search engines, of course, to recognize what your content is and what it means. 
And that's why we have an entire course in Project 24 about snippet optimization. It's not just about the table. It's not just about this little answer paragraph. Those are two of the different methods that we use to target winning those rich snippets. Now, what about writing the rest of the article? How do we make sure the content is good? Well, the most important thing is actually the way that you structure the content. We have what we call the post recipe. This is what we use as the basis for most of our blog posts. And what it does is it outlines the standard format of a blog post. You start at the beginning, you have an introduction, you have an answer paragraph. This is the answer target, maybe some sort of a segue into the main content. And then you come up with usually three to five different subheadings, different aspects of the topic that you can cover in great depth. These aspects of the topic, we don't want them to go too far astray from the main search query. Um, we want them to all be very closely related to each other, but we want to make sure that the content is extremely helpful and that if there are any nuances to the answer, that we answer those very clearly using each of our little subtopics. Each one of those has an H2 subheading followed by whatever content we need to write. By outlining our articles in this way, it actually makes them very easy to write. We start with the main search query, we answer the main question, and then we identify what are the main additional areas we want to go down. We write those subheadings, and now all we have to do is write three to five very short articles on each one of those subtopics. And that's how our writers are able to, in two hours, write a great thousand word blog post that they both researched and wrote. And it also helps make sure that you cover the topic in it with enough clarity and with enough depth to be helpful for people and to make it easy for Google to understand. Now there are different structures of blog posts. Obviously there's list type articles, there's how to type articles. And that's why in project 24, we teach how to take the principles from the post recipe and then how to apply it to all these different formats and these different post structures. Now let's talk a little bit about technical SEO. All right, we're back at the blackboard. First, this approach to SEO has really helped a lot of people to be able to finally succeed at getting organic traffic to their content. If you have found this video to be helpful for you and you appreciate that, I'd love it if you'd go ahead and give this video a like. But now let's get back to the content. We're going to dive now into technical SEO. Technical SEO is just kind of all of the little other things that need to be done on a site to help ensure that it does well in the rankings. Most of the things we'll talk about here are essentially pass fail. Here's a list of a bunch of technical SEO factors that are important to get right, but that you, we don't need to do a whole lot of work for. We need things like an SSL certificate for the website. This has essentially become a must have, even if you're not taking payments on your site. Now, an SSL certificate can be totally free. Most hosts will just set that up for you. Um, there's an initiative called Let's Encrypt. It's been out for a long time now that is providing free SSL certificates to help make the entire web more secure. We mentioned before use of images. Whether or not you have images in a blog post, in some ways is kind of pass fail. We need to use photos. It enhances the content dramatically. If you don't have them, add them. The next one, speed and core web vitals. I mentioned this earlier. Again, this is more of a technical thing. And all of these tests are essentially pass fail. If you pass, great. If you don't, too bad. Now, this one, like some of the others on this list, are kind of like tiebreaker SEO ranking factors. What I mean by that is, if everything else is equal and two pieces of content are equally relevant and equally authoritative and equally everything else, then these issues kind of come into effect. So unless your site is performing really bad in Core Web Vitals, it's probably not gonna make a huge difference if you invest a ton of time to fix it. That said, if you build your website right from the start, this isn't gonna be much of a problem for you. Okay, you shouldn't have malware on your site. Navigation throughout your site should be pretty straightforward and easy for people to use. Um, the length of URLs shouldn't be just insanely and absurdly long. Again, that is really not that big of a thing today. This next one though is important. More and more of internet traffic is being done on mobile devices. If your website is not yet mobile friendly, meaning when the screen shrinks down to the size of a phone, the content isn't easily legible and things are lined up pretty well, we need to fix that. If you're using WordPress, that's pretty easy. We just need to use a nice responsive theme and the problem's generally gonna be solved for you. Likewise, we don't want an excessive amount of broken links on our website. It's usually not a big problem, but what happens is over time, when we link out to other people's sites or we interlink on our own sites, if we delete pages that we linked to or when we link out to other people's websites, if they delete pages on their website that we linked to, we now have broken links. 
it's something worth checking on every now and then and making sure that we update those broken links. But again, having some broken links here and there that last for a little while until you check on it again is not gonna cause a problem for your site. Just don't let it get out of hand. Okay, these next couple are quite important. They're still generally pass fail, but they're, they're very important. Over monetization, if you have tons and tons of affiliate links everywhere, you could see yourself just getting completely hammered. Last year, we saw multiple algorithm updates that just continued to further and further decimate sites where people were just filling the articles with affiliate links. The same, by the way, can be said for ads. If we're showing too many ads and we have you know, interstitial ads that pop up between pages, you click to load another page, it, boom, full screen ad first, you gotta watch it for 10, 20, 30 seconds, or maybe click the X, and then we'll let you uh, see the content. Um, or you have ads that pop up and that actually cover the main content of the page. Those kinds of behaviors are going to lead to penalties. Just chill it a little bit with the monetization. If we have good content, the monetization is not that hard without overdoing it. Copyright issues and plagiarism. If it turns out that you are plagiarizing other people's sites, you might get away with it for a little while. But eventually, when you get found out, your site is probably gonna be completely destroyed. I have had multiple sites completely removed from Google's index because they were stealing my content. I've had Project 24 members who have successfully done the same. Spinning content likewise is just a shady tactic and I have gotten people demonetized with their ad provider by proving to them that their content was a replication of mine. It's not a good practice. Create original content. If you're not doing that, you probably shouldn't be trying to use content to rank well on Google. As a general rule, tricky, shady, and unethical shortcuts might get you a little bit ahead in the short term, but you are always, you're always chancing a huge risk of having your entire website penalized or even completely removed. It's not worth it. Then the last one on this list is schema usage. Schema is a way that we can mark certain things on our um, pages of our website so that they can show up in a nice format in the Google search. If you think about like news articles that typically will have the image show up as well as just some other information in addition to what you would normally see in a normal search result. Likewise for recipes, we'll often see a star rating, how long it's supposed to take to make that food item, those types of things. That is because those sites are using schema markup. If you have a site in one of those industries, you should be using schema markup on recipes and on news articles. Likewise, it's not a bad idea to use schema markup for your business um, or if you're a public figure for you as a person. That way you can have kind of that nice little card that shows up um, either in the sidebar or even in the main search if someone does a search for you or for your business. Many of the SEO plugins and some WordPress themes have this built in. Rank Math is really one of my favorite uh, SEO plugins specifically for schema. I don't really use it for most anything else. I don't worry about most of the features that it has. I actually encourage a lot of people to not use SEO plugins simply because a lot of the tools that they have lead you to believe that several of these activities you can do <laughs> um, to try to pass all their little tests are actually gonna make any difference to the SEO of your content. Most of it will not. And if you do it wrong, there are some settings you could set that could actually harm your site from an SEO standpoint. So be careful with that. If you leave the default settings and just add some schema markup for your organization and for you as an author or for you as you know, the site owner or the business owner, you're gonna be just fine. And that's really my number one use case for using um, those SEO plugins. When it comes to all of those things, those technical SEO things, what I find is that those ones that I mentioned that are important, they're important to have. If you don't have them, it can be detrimental to your site. But what I found is that trying to make step-by-step -step improvements in most of those things does very little. Adding some schema markup about your organization is not suddenly gonna drive a ton, of, a ton of traffic to your website. Adding an SSL certificate to your website, it is important. But when you add that SSL certificate, you're not suddenly gonna see a big ramp up in traffic. It's just one of those things that if you don't do it over time, it's going to have an effect on your website's performance. This is why we've created Project 24 and to give you the blogging system that walks you step by step through the entire process, including the build of the website, which covers most of this technical SEO. 
We created the Akabata WordPress theme that's fast, that passes Core Web Vitals, that gives you schema markup, all the things you need to ensure that you're covered from a technical SEO standpoint. Project 24 is intended to help anyone who has a website or wants to create a website to win with SEO from a technical SEO standpoint, on-page SEO standpoint, and off-page SEO. But if Project 24 isn't an option for you right now, don't sweat it. That's why I make videos like this one. In fact, I've got another video for you that walks more through the blogging system process in a more step-by-step -step fashion that I'll link to right there for you. So you can go check that out next if you haven't seen it before. All right, there's a lot of information here, but we're getting through it. Um, let's talk now a bit about off-page SEO. Off-page SEO is important, and essentially what it is is it's all the stuff that's not on your website that impacts your website's SEO performance. This would include things like the backlinks, um, but it also includes every other aspect of your online reputation. So when it comes to off-page SEO, the goal here is not links. The goal is actually E-A-T. And really, I have a whole video that I did recently on link building. So if you're curious to dive into that topic a little bit more in detail, I've got some pretty good uh, instructions in there on exactly what to do instead of link building. But we'll talk about it a little bit here. The objective here is to build expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness within our industry. We do that through what is called industry outreach. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. First, I want to bring up one more thing that's really important. EAT is one of those things that I don't worry a ton about in a lot of industries that I build websites in. Because I build a lot of niche websites on hobbies and various other topics, the content is actually sufficient EAT in a lot of those cases. By having a substantial amount of content on a website, covering it in pretty good depth, I become authoritative on the subject. The user experience is good, and so as users start to see that and seem to trust in it, Google treats it the same way. And as one article does better, the other articles on the website, especially the ones it links to, they perform better, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, there are a lot of industries and there are some topics where EAT is really important. One of the things to consider is industries that are considered YMYL. Google coined this, it stands for your money, your life. Websites on the topics of money, finances, and life, health, wellness, that sort of stuff, uh, Google has a particular interest in making sure that the content that people receive is authoritative and accurate. And so in those industries, they have a higher level of scrutiny for EAT, especially for search queries that are particularly vital. You see, YMYL is slowly expanding to cover substantially more um, industries. In fact, this is a screenshot from those quality rater guidelines. These are the things that they're now including as YMYL. But YMYL is not like an off and on, yes or no, pass fail sort of a thing. I honestly believe that it's more of a spectrum. There are search queries that are heavily YMYL, and then there are search queries that are lightly YMYL. Things that are, eh, it's maybe not quite so pivotal that this information be provided by a medical doctor or by, you know, in the case of money, um, a certified financial planner. It's okay to surface content that wasn't written by a credentialed professional. So that's just something to keep in mind. If you're entering an industry that falls heavily into that YMYL space, the EAT stuff is going to be of particular importance. Now, most SEOs are going to tell you that you need to build links or do link building for this to work at all. There's a lot of reasons why this isn't going to work, especially when you're first getting started. Number one, remember what we talked about before? The sites you link out to impact the credibility, the EAT of your own website. People don't want to link out to sites with no authority or sites that aren't highly relevant to their site. And so, if you only have 10 blog posts on your site, why would anybody want to link to you? I'll tell you why. They would want to link to you because you pay them to. And that actually is considered a link scheme and violates Google's terms. It's a pretty quick way to get yourself penalized. There is the option to do what they call broken link building, which is where you scour other people's websites, find all the links on their site that are broken, which is when they've linked out to another site somewhere, but now that other site's removed that content. It's a broken link. And it's helpful for those people to have a different resource that they can link to. However, you have to look really hard to find other people's websites with a broken link that is relevant to content that you've already created, or you need to create a piece of content specifically dedicated to that person, email them, and hope that they choose to link back to your website 
um, replacing their broken link with the link to your content. It's probably one of the more effective means when you have a smaller site, simply because it's better for them than having a broken link. However, it can take a ton of your time, especially when you don't have very much content yet. Most people will tell you spend about half your time creating content and half your time building links. My recommendation is this. When you have a new site or one that's not yet working and you're just finally now starting this process, spend 100% of your time on content creation until you've written 30 to 50 new pieces of content. At that point, we can start doing what we call industry outreach. Industry outreach may include some of the tactics like finding broken links on people's sites, especially if you've created a really, really good resource that's highly relevant in your industry and that a lot of people are likely to want to link out to there's a good chance that those other sites that have broken links will have some of those where your new awesome piece of content would be relevant. I highly recommend getting yourself interviewed by a podcaster, by someone with a YouTube channel. It's not hard to find podcasts in your industry. Just go to any podcast player and look it up. And for a lot of those, you'll be able to find a website that accompanies the podcast. You'll be able to find contact information and you'll be able to request being an interviewee on their podcast. Doing this is great because it gets you the link, but it gets you so much more than that. And that's why the term link building is such a misnomer. It's not just about the link. It's about the authority that you gain by sharing a message with that person's audience. Prepare yourself for that podcast. Listen to some episodes of where they interviewed other people. Think about what kinds of questions they ask and what message you want to get across. If there are specific questions you'd like them to ask you, ask them if they'd be willing to ask those specific questions, and then you'll be able to get that message across and be viewed as an expert, an authority within your space. Expert, authority, even a trusted person. Now we got the whole EAT covered. Another great tool for this is HARO, H-A-R-O. It's help a reporter out. Just go Google that, you'll find it. People use HARO all the time to try to find experts that they can cite, that they can quote in their articles. You go on there and you find questions that are being asked that are highly relevant to your industry and you go give them a quote. And then if they select you, you're gonna get quoted in their piece of content and oftentimes you'll get a link as well. But also you get the quote that for their readers as well as for Google, start to see you as an authority within your space. When you do these things and people do ask you, hey, well, where, what should I link people to? It's important that we have them linked to the right thing. If there's a specific piece of content that's most relevant to the thing that they're talking about. So if you do an interview and you're talking about a specific topic and you have a really good piece of content that you'd love to get ranked for that, have them linked to that specific piece of content. If an interview is more generically intended to just build up your expertise, Having that link go to your personal about page or your website about page or even the website home page, each of those is going to help establish the authority of either you or your website within that industry. One of the other main determinants of EAT is actually what's called the main content of your website. Every single page or every single post on your website has main content. It's the stuff on that page that is the main purpose of why people would come to that page. In a blog post, it's the content, the text. Everything around it, the stuff in the sidebar and the footer and all those other things, that's not part of the main content. As we create more main content within an industry, within a niche, we increase our level of authoritativeness within that niche. We help that even further by making sure we have a large amount of content within each topic. And so if I'm gonna cover the topic of how much of foods to serve to large crowds of people, I'm gonna have a lot of content on a website that's about serving sizes. And search engines are gonna recognize that people view the content on my website as authoritative when it comes to serving sizes. Whatever industry you're in, whatever niche you're in, it's extremely valuable to pick some specific verticals, specific topics within your niche, and then writing a lot of content on each one of those topics interlinking between those articles anywhere and everywhere that it makes sense. When in the content you mention something that you talk about in more detail on another blog post, put a link to that other blog post. Help the search engine and help the users find the other content on your website that's most relevant to that topic and that establishes you as an authority simply by the sheer volume and depth of content that you have around that topic on your site. Look, building sites and using them to get organic traffic through all of these SEO techniques, that's what this YouTube channel is all about. 
If you want to learn more about our process for building a website and using that content from your blog to drive traffic to your site, I invite you to go watch this video right here and I hope to see you there soon.